Jeff Picaro on behalf of Starlix and myself, I'd like to welcome you to what I think is going to be a very informative and fun session. I intend on covering the next 50 minutes or so what I think to be the two basic grooves in contemporary music, that is your straight eighth and sixteenth note groove and your shuffle groove, which is derived from triplets. We also will be covering how I construct my patterns, some technique involved, and some exercises that may be helpful to you as you develop these grooves and feels. So uh, why don't we begin with the straight eighth groove. Now when I come up with a pattern for a new song that I've heard for the first time, I pay close attention to the bass part, any vocal that's there, meaning really paying attention to the phrasing of the vocalist, and that pretty much will dictate the time and the groove. Not only the bass part, but maybe rhythmically what the keyboards or guitar are playing. Uh, to give you an example of this, when I did the Steely Dan tune FM, it was kind of a groove basically that went like this, boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. So when I first heard that, the first thing I did was to play sixteenths on the hi hat, and it was something like this. Immediately, I didn't like that. I thought it was just a bit too busy. It made the groove just too stiff and didn't have that snaky feeling when I just heard the guys playing it by themselves. So I went to eighth notes. And it would be something like this. Now coming up with that pattern, I want to point out that it's important when I played just the eighth notes on the hi-hat, it wasn't like I just played them the same dynamic, you know, real stiff. I put kind of an inner lope to it. Its own inner dynamic, up and down. And that helped with the groove. Because that's basically what I do when I'm listening to most patterns, is think of all avenues, whether it be sixteenths, some sixteenths and eighths, or eighth notes, and then play with the inner balance the inner dynamic of those within the bar. In keeping with the topic of the hi-hat and the dynamics within the beat, I like to practice little hi-hat exercises. That is, you know, playing eighth notes, adding in sixteenth notes, and different variations of accents and dynamics. For instance, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. And now accent, quarter notes. Half notes. Then I'll start adding sixteenth notes. And I'll turn, you know, it'll be adding a sixteenth note. Or Now the reason I do these little exercises with the eighth notes and sixteenths and all the variations, because it's helpful for me when I'm developing drum beats for songs. And I like to practice, for instance, playing one and three on the bass drum, two and four on the snare drum, and finding out what these different figures, the different places I put sixteenth notes or eighth notes, does to the lope or the feel, for instance. Now's a good time, I think, to talk about uh, stick technique, how I hold my sticks. I use a uh, match grip, and I hold it with the fulcrum between the first joint and my index finger, the top joint, and the meat of my thumb here. Here's my fulcrum with the sticks wrapped around. I think it's good that you investigate your technique and work on that. Doing, I do snap-ups to develop the wrist and the arm. 
And the reason I mention that, it's really good. I think this technique, these kind of chops are good to execute sixteenths. Now, there's two ways to play sixteenths, and it depends on the tempo, but there's the hand-to-hand uh, -hand method, the alternate groove, alternating stroke method of doing sixteenths. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a. I like the single-handed method because it's a lot smoother feel it coming from one wrist and hand here. The reason I say so, the more you develop it, it helps with the execution of sixteenths and up-tempo things. For instance, a Mike McDonald record I keep forgetting. Um, I tried doing the alternating stroke method of doing sixteenths, and it sounded just too stiff and staccato for me. Uh, to give you an example. Compared to Let's continue with these 16th note patterns. We'll keep 16th notes going on our right hand, but this time let's develop the bass drum. Try different patterns on your bass drum, and once you come with a couple that you feel comfortable with, make two bar phrases out of these patterns, and rehearse those several times. I'll give you a couple examples. Now's a good time to get into bass drum technique. At least uh, how I developed mine goes back to when I was a young kid, first learning to play drums. I couldn't reach my dad's pedal, so I play with my toes, basically, and the ball of my foot. And uh, I guess you could say I dance on the pedals. And I like to slide up into my pedal when I'm doing some fast stuff. To give you an example. I slide. So that's how I go about playing my bass drum. It's the toe and ball method. Now, if we can continue with the 16th notes, I want to get into one of my favorite grooves, and that's a samba type feeling, or variations of a samba feeling. Samba feeling being this. Now what I'm playing is, it's eighth notes and sixteenths on the hi-hat. And I'm opening the hi-hat on quarter notes. And closing them on the eighth notes. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Now the bass drum pattern I'm going to play with the hi-hat pattern is a dotted eighth note and a sixteenth. Combining the two with the back beats on two and four, you have. The reason I like this beat is because it's a very versatile beat, at least for me, uh, to be used in the traditional two and four, like I just demonstrated, and also in halftime, like this. Now that we've gone over the eighth note and sixteenth note grooves, especially the latter with the samba feel, I'd like to demonstrate on a variation of a Toto tune from the last album how I came up with the beat. So what I'll ask Mike and David to do is play a variation of that tune, and I'll explain what I heard and how I came up with the pattern I did. Gentlemen? Now the obvious 
beat that you may think of coming up with that would be the traditional backbeat on two and four, for example. One, two, three. Now, just for fun's sake, when I always hear a tune, I, like I said earlier in the tape, I like to think of all the variations of that groove that would fit in to leave space and for something unique. So when I first heard the groove, I was thinking of that King Solomon's Mind type thing, where I wanted the backbeat, the beats to be much more spread out, so the grooves to be much more halftime feeling. And it was more something like this. One, two, one, two. Guys, can we play a taste of that with me demonstrating just this simple thing? One, two, three, four. Now that I've established the groove of the song, it being the halftime groove with the tom-toms leading me into the third beat, it's time to fill out the rest of the bar. So if you refer to the back of the booklet, there's a snare drum solo written out. And within that snare drum solo, you'll notice there's a paradiddle starting on the second beat and a paradiddle diddle starting on the and of three. And it should sound something like this. I'll play it on the hi-hat. Now notice how I'm accenting on one and three, the third beat being the snare drum, and there's a little ghost note. So you notice now, when I just did that exercise, I really was laying the accents on one and three. The third accent will land on the snare, and there'll be a ghost note, a 16th note ghost note, right after that third beat on the snare. Now what I'll do is, after you get comfortable with the exercise, bring it over to the drums and orchestrate that pattern on the toms, the rim, cymbals, whatever. And it should sound something like this. One, two, three. Next, I'd like to get into the shuffle groove. That is the groove derived from triplets. And what I'd like to start off with, we'll start with our eighth note triplet groove. This is the kind of groove you can hear uh, in Sly and the Family Stones, Hot Fun in the Summertime, which uh, I stole from to get my beat for Hold the Line. And that is triplets being, I'll demonstrate on the hi-hat, one ta-ta, two ta-ta, three ta-ta, four ta-ta. Now, just keeping triplets, what I'm going to do is, on the bass drum, I'm going to play a pattern hitting the bass drum on the downbeat of one and on the last triplet of the second beat. And I'm going to hit snare drum on two and four. So with the guys, what I'm going to do is we're going to play, it's actually like a, a shuffle Charleston figure, and I'm going to play different variations, accenting the hi-hat differently, Maybe opening the hi-hat on the last triplet of the fourth beat and closing it on one. And just messing around with different accents, variations of this groove. Example. One, two, three. <laughs> Next, we're going to get into the shuffle groove. And that is the first and last note of the triplet on the first beat, the first and last note 
of the triplet on the second, the first and last note of the triplet on the third, and the first and last note of the triplet on the fourth. Something like this. One ta ta, two ta ta, three ta ta, four ta ta. One, two, three, four. I'm going to play a backbeats on the snare drum on two and four. And the bass drum, I'm going to play the first and last note of the triplet on the first beat, and the last note of the triplet on the second beat. The first and last triplet of the third beat, and the last note of the triplet on the fourth beat. Something like this. Now you'll notice what I like to do is on the backbeats, you hear a ghost note after each backbeat, a, a ghost eighth note triplet beat there, like this. Now this is the kind of beat and the variations of this beat that I used on like Lido Shuffle and Black Friday and whatnot. So maybe we can play a taste of a little up-tempo shuffle groove for you here. One, two, That's the shuffle, one version. Another version is playing with the left hand what you're playing with your right hand. That is the first beat and the last beat of the triplet of beats one, two, three, and four. And that would sound something like this. Now you'll notice I'm not making the accents, the beats even in dynamics with the left hand, because I want the two and four to land real nice, sounding like this again. So that's the kind of groove you hear sometimes, what's the Marvin Gaye tune, Trouble Man, real nice, bluesy, sexy type things, something like this. Let's play a little bit. One, two, three. Next, I'd like to get into the halftime shuffle groove. This groove is one of my favorites. Some of my favorite drummers, I love hearing them play this kind of groove. Um, I use the halftime shuffle groove on the tune Rosanna, the Toto Cut. And I've been asked about that beat a lot, so I'd like to try to explain that beat at the best of my ability right now, get it clear. I stole that beat from listening to two records. One was Home at Last, and Babylon Sisters, which is Bernard Purdy, Steely Dan Records. Another is the John Bonham on A Fool in the Rain, as Led Zeppelin tune. The Bernard Purdy thing, I like to call it the Bernard Purdy halftime shuffle, is basically this. The John Bonham beat that I copied from Fool in the Rain was something like this. Putting those two beats together, I came up with my own little kind of hybrid. For Rosanna, I added the Bo Diddley figure. It's a shuffle Bo Diddley figure, basically. And putting them together, this is what it came up with. All right, let me break this beat down for you. 
On the hi-hat, I'm playing the first and last note of the triplet on each beat. With the left hand, I'm going to ghost the second note of each triplet on each beat, something like this. One, one, one. Now I'm going to add the backbeat on the third beat on the snare drum, and I'm going to ghost the second note of the third triplet, something like this. Now I'm going to add the Bo Diddley shuffle bass drum figure. Bon. And all together it should be something like this. That's the basic groove. Now you can do things like play quarter notes on the hi-hat like Bernard do to get a different kind of lope out of it. And that would sound like this. OK, now I'm going to play a little bit of this groove with the band so that you can play along. One, two, three. Okay, and another shuffle groove that I like to play is one that for me comes from the jazz cymbal beat, which is the one ta ta two ta ta three ta ta four ta ta one ta ta two ta ta three ta ta four ta ta one ta ta two ta ta three ta ta four. Now, I would recommend listening to some jazz albums and playing along just with your right hand. and build up because you could take the jazz beat and apply it to some contemporary nice grooves thusly and it would sound something like this and you can mess with the hi-hat So I'm going to play a little bit of that with the rhythm section and check it out. One, two, three. Another halftime groove you can do is earlier I showed you the cymbal beat, the jazz cymbal beat, and how that applied to a shuffle with the back beats. We'll do the same beat with the hi hat, except now I'll put the snare drum on the third beat. Something like this.
now we'll demonstrate it with the rhythm section. One, two, In closing, I'd like to re-emphasize what I said earlier, and that is you should work on your technique, your fundamental rudiments, and really listen to as many records as possible so you can hear all sorts of grooves, all sorts of different drummers and their interpretations of those grooves, and play as much as possible. I would also like to thank Richie Honori and Joe Picaro for their technical assistance, Bill Schnee for engineering, and Mike Picaro and David Garfield for being in the rhythm section. And uh, we'd like to close with a Garfield composition called Creature's Stomp.
Hi, I'm Joe Picaro. Today we're going to explore some of the many facets of playing jazz, like cymbal time, cymbal turnarounds, rudiments and rhythms orchestrated around the kit. We're also going to show you how your jazz chops can be applied to rock and pop. So let's begin with the most basic aspect of playing jazz, swing and cymbal time. The jazz cymbal beat is based on the triplet feel. Triplets are counted like this. One to two to three to four to one. Interpretation of the jazz cymbal beat depends on tempo. For medium to fast tempos, you can play the cymbal rhythm based on the eighth note triplet feel like this. One to two to three to four to one to two to three to four to one to two to three to four to one. If you don't want to count it, you could vocalize it like this. One, two, 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 two three, two, two, four, two, two, please shut the door. Shut the door, shut the door, shut the door. Now I'll play it on the cymbal for you. One, two, 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 two three, two, two, four, two, two. For very slow to medium tempos, you can base the cymbal rhythm on the 16th note triplets like this. One to enter to two to to enter to three to to enter to four to to enter to enter to two to to enter to three to to enter to four to to enter to one to to enter to two to to enter to three to to enter to four to to enter to one. Or you can vocalize it. Three to to enter to four to to enter to please shut the door. Shut the door. Shut the door, shut the door. And now on the symbol. Three to enter to four to enter to. For very fast tempos, you can interpret the jazz symbol beat as even eighth notes like this. One, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one. Or you could vocalize it. One, two, and three, four, and please shut the door, shut the door, shut the door, shut the door. Now let's play it up to tempo. One, two, one, two, three, four. Now let's play it on the cymbal. One, two, or one, two, three, four. The jazz cymbal beat is very personal. Different drummers feel the skip beat differently. The skip beats, of course, are the notes played on the last ta of the triplet going into beat three and the last ta of the triplet leading back into beat one. In developing your cymbal beat, besides the concept of where you place the skip beat, it's also most important how you feel the quarter notes, beats one, two, three, and four. One concept is to stress all four quarters equally like this. A one, two, three, four. Another concept is to stress two and four like this. One, two, three, four. Or you can stress one and three like this. One, two, three, four. You can even stress the skip beat itself. Elvin Jones is noted for that. One, two, three, four. Each of these methods has been used by some great drummers and they've all made them swing. What's important is not that you choose one method over the other, but that you make it work for you and swing. Listen to some of the early Miles Davis jazz records, John Coltrane, Max Roach, Shelly Mann. Check out the drummer cymbal style and you'll see what I'm talking about.
At this point, I'd like to show you how to take the conventional jazz cymbal beat, which is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and turn it around rhythmically to make variations on the basic pattern like this. One, two, three, four. Now let's take this same symbol turnaround and use it to punctuate a four bar phrase. A one, two, three, four. As you can hear, this small change in the fourth bar serves as a punctuation that leads the listener and the band into the next phrase. Here's a few more variations. One, two, three, four. And another. One, two, three, four. And another. One, two, three, four. Still another, one, two, three, four. And one more. You should play all of these turnarounds in a four bar phrase. That's three bars of time followed by a turnaround. Now let's talk about playing musically at the drum set. The tune we played at the beginning of the tape called Blues by Five by Miles Davis is a great example of the basic 12 bar blues. The theme or head is two choruses long. That's one time through a 12 bar chorus, then one repeat. So the song is really 24 bars long. After the head is played twice, each soloist then improvises over two or more 12 bar choruses. So the basic blues is made up of three four bar phrases, and that's one chorus. It's the drummer's job to punctuate the song form using cymbal turnarounds and fills which are made up of rudiments, rhythm patterns, and time patterns orchestrated around the drum set. Okay, Tom is going to play the first four bars of the melody on the piano. Listen for the space at the end of the phrase. Tom? Did you hear the space at the end of the phrase, the resting point, where the melody breathes? Now listen to the whole 12 bar chorus. Again, notice the spaces at the end of each phrase where the melody breathes. Those resting points at the end of the 4th, 8th, and 12th bars are where you would use punctuation devices like cymbal turnarounds and drum fills. Now, let's play one chorus with the band using some cymbal turnarounds to punctuate the song form.
By using the two bar symbol turnarounds, you can open up a vast vocabulary of rhythmic possibilities. One concept is playing in three over two bars in four four time. It's a rhythmic technique often used by Indian drummers called a tihai. A tihai is a three beat rhythm repeated three times over a two bar phrase in four four time. The last note of the third repeat will be on the downbeat leading into the next phrase or chorus like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. As you can hear, this creates a three against four over the bar line feel. Now let's apply the jazz cymbal beat to the T high. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Here are some variations, this time using a four bar phrase. I'll play two bars of regular cymbal time, and the third bar, I'll start the T high to punctuate the four bar phrase. One, two, three, four. And here's another example. One, two, three, four. Still another. One, two, three, four. Okay, now I'm going to play a whole chorus with the band using cymbal turnarounds and T-highs to punctuate the blues song form. Notice that there will be a one bar cymbal turnaround in bars four and eight. And then in bars 11 and 12, I'll use a T high, which is slightly more involved, to set up the next chorus. Let's expand your vocabulary of two bar turnarounds by using tied notes to alter the rhythmic feel of the cymbal pattern. The rule for tied notes is when two notes are tied together, play the first note only. You can think of the second note as taking the place of a rest of the same duration. I'll play each example first without the ties, then again using tied notes so that you can hear how it alters the feel. Now here's an example without the tie. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And now here's the same example with the tie. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now let me give you another example without the tie. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And still again, now the same example with the tie. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, now we can get into the two bar phrases using tied notes. Here are some examples in a four bar phrase. One, two, three, four. Okay, now here's another example. One, two, three, four. And then one more. One, two, three, four. You can take similar exercise and orchestrate parts of the cymbal rhythms on the snare and add fills. A one, two, three, four.
Okay, you should practice all of these exercises in a four bar phrase. Play two bars of time followed by a two bar symbol turnaround. As an exercise, memorize all of the symbol turnarounds and play them at all tempos from very slow to very fast. There are many areas you must be aware of when playing any style of music at the drum set. Of course, the number one priority, no matter what style of music, is to develop steady time with a good feel. After that, being aware of the song form is very important. Developing good hand technique, learning the rudiments, learning the sight read, and studying music theory are next in order. Knowing how and when to punctuate the song form with simple turnarounds and drum fills is the next step. And last is developing motifs and solos through the use of orchestrated rhythms like rudiments, polymeters, and odd meters orchestrated around the drum set. At this point, let's talk about another important feel when we're playing jazz, the two feel. I'll demonstrate first on the hi-hat. The bass drum can be played lightly on one and three, for starters. It should never be played loudly, rather more felt than heard. Of course, it can be brought out more when accenting with cymbal or open hi-hat. After you're comfortable with the basic rhythm, you can begin to improvise more while keeping the basic two feel. Now I'll show you where the open and close strokes fall when playing the two feel on the hi-hat. I'm going to open on one, close on two, then I'm going to open on the skip beat of two, going into three, then I'm going to leave it open on three, I'm going to close on four, then I'm going to open on the skip beat of four going back to one, and then I'm going to have one open again. So here we go, here's a demonstration. One, two, three, four. All of the cymbal turnarounds we looked at so far can also be played on the hi-hat using closed and open sounds. Here's a one bar turnaround. One, two, three, four. And here's a two bar turnaround. A one, two, three, four. Here's a two feel on the right cymbal. A one, two, three, four. When playing the blues, note that the two feel is sustained for the first two choruses. The third time around, however, you can slide into a walking four feel for the solo choruses. Let's see how it sounds with the band.
To perform all the things we've gone over so far, you've got to develop the hand technique to bring it off. And that requires some backing up and getting down to some basic exercises. So let's start with the most important area in snare drum technique, and that's your grip. Sometimes it's called the fulcrum. So the thumb is across from the index finger, the first knuckle, and you'll see that there's some space here. And this is what the grip should look like. Then your fingers go around the stick, and by keeping the stick against and across this first knuckle, the stick is kind of in line with your forearm. So it looks like this. So, and of course, this goes the same when you're doing match grip. In your left hand, the stick goes right under the thumb, thumb straight, two fingers over, two fingers underneath. The back of your wrist, your wrist should not be bent, you know, way in or way in, just natural, just in line with your forearm, and you bring the stick up. And this is what your hand should look like when you first start off in your playing position. So I'm going to show you some arm exercises that you could get into when you warm up every day. And this develops your wrist, your forearm, and then your whole arm, all the way up like this. So I'll do that again for you. Here's wrist, forearm, all the way up, open the fingers, come down and hit the pad. Your left hand. Start low, snap the wrist up, bring the whole forearm right by your belly button, stretch, you know, stretch your whole shoulder right in. As you go up, you turn out, turn your wrist, turn in, come down and hit the pad. Now I'll do both arms in a couple of sequences. Snap up, 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 down, up, up, up. Down, up, turn in, go up, turn, back down. Do about 50, 50 of these in the morning and you're ready to attack the drums. Okay, now let me show you another exercise, what I call wrist snap-ups. Now this is a no-bounce technique. The wrist is doing all the work. Now the stick is not going to be away from the palm of your hand like you normally play. It's going to be against the palm of the hand. So there's no bouncing involved. You literally have to bring the stick up with your wrist, like so. Left hand, turn up. And here's a roll exercise to develop your second stroke in your roll. Down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down. And then you can come right back up, two strokes with each hand. Up, 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 up. No bouncing. This is all wrist strokes. And then you should practice the alternate stroke, alternating stickings. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. OK. Now. After you've worked on these exercises and you stretched your muscles and you limbered up, then you go into what we call the wrist bounce. Now, the wrist bounce is how I normally play most of my strokes in rudiments and, you know, my all-around playing. And what I try to do is to let the stick bounce off the drum head, just like you would let a ball dribble when you dribble a ball, bouncing ball, same effect, like I bounce I'm going to show you just with the fulcrum, bouncing the stick off the head of the drum. Now, if you bounce this stick, you know, you get your good balance position with the stick, and you dribble the stick. That's, this will give you a good feel for the bounce. I'm going to dribble the stick with my right hand, just like I'm bouncing a ball. So then, once you get the feel, it feels pretty good, then you do it with your wrist. And if you notice, this time now the stick is away from the palm of the hand. So now I'm into what we call a wrist bounce. Playing off the head. I'm drawing the sound right out of the snare drum. Traditional grip, same thing. I'll do it without the fingers at first. I'm going to bounce off.
going to bounce it. Get the feel of the bounce. If you don't get it at first by doing it with your wrist, just take your left hand and practice dribbling the stick. And you'll get a feel for it after a while. Now back with fingers on the stick. And there's the traditional grip with the bounce. Now I'll play some singles to show you what's happening. You should practice different levels, low, and then high. Now, finger bounce, same thing. Take your left hand, have your stick in your right hand, practice the bounce like you're bouncing a ball. Now on the finger bounce, your thumb and index finger are gonna kinda stay stationary and these three fingers are just the, you know, the third and fourth finger, the pinky doesn't have to work, will do all the playing for you. And these, you know, you have to think of these separate, the, the thumb and index finger and these three fingers, independent of each other. So here, bounce the stick, then continue with your fingers. Then you could check yourself by holding your wrist a little bit and making sure that your fingers are really doing the work. Left hand, traditional grip, same thing. Get your fulcrum, get your grip, bounce the stick. Then fingers, continue with your fingers. Once that feels pretty good, put the other two fingers underneath and you're on your way. Now, let's play some single strokes with the finger technique. And then some double strokes. Okay, then I'd like to show you uh, what I call the reverse finger technique. And this is very useful for when you want to play a very relaxed style in jazz playing. So, this is pretty complicated. I'm going to show you the first stroke in two sections, and then we'll do it all in one section. Here's the first stroke. Start with your fingers on the stick, stick away from the palm of the hand. You close the fingers on your downstroke. Then you bring the stick back up, and you start all over again. This is the first stroke in two sections. Again, close. Bring the stick up. Now I'm going to show you this first stroke again, but you're going to do all two of those strokes in one movement, like so. Close and come right back up. Once again, don't forget, start open. Fingers away from the palm of the hand. Close and come up at the same time. That's the first stroke. Now the second stroke, you hit the pad and you open your fingers. That's all that's involved in the second stroke. So we have close, open, close, open, close, open. And as you can see, this is being done in kind of a mechanical way right now, just to get the feel of the close and open. Now, we do the same thing a little faster, except we start to bounce, really relax. Let the stick do all the work, and you just make the motions of close and open. Go faster. And you're on your way. A little faster. Now, if you notice, I was kind of bending my knuckle and my thumb. This kind of helps, you know, when you're doing the close and open uh, style. But a lot of drummers do it without bending the knuckle. I just, for me, it feels good when I bend the knuckle. But it's not a must. Okay. Now, that's for when you're keeping regular time. You know, close, open, close, open, close. So you're closing on downbeats, like one, e, and uh, two, e, and uh, three, e, and uh, four, e, and uh, or one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one. Okay, now for the open roll, 
the stroke is done opposite. You start with the close stroke, you open the first note, you close the second note, but you make sure you bounce up also. So it's open, close. There's your double stroke. Open, close. Open, close. Open, close. Open, close. Put two together. Open, close. Open, close. Open, close. Open, close. And then keep going. Open, close. Open, close. Open, close. Open, close. Now do a little faster. This is what I call separate doubles. It's a great exercise to make sure that that second stroke is happening. Don't play a long roll and the second stroke isn't happening and you're just wasting time. What I call constructive practicing. Put two together, then keep going. A little faster. So let me show you one last technique about using the reverse finger technique. I like to use this technique when I'm playing uh, relaxed cymbal patterns at a pretty up tempo or like some samba patterns. So you close on the first beat of the cymbal beat, you close, and then on two you open, and on the last two of two is a finger stroke. And then you repeat the procedure from three to four. Three, you open on four, and then the last two of four is a finger stroke. So here it is up to tempo now. One, two, three, four. 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 One. A little faster. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one. A little faster with the even, uh, like for a samba feel, even eights and cut time. One, two, two, two. Okay, in closing about this hand technique, let me just say that uh, I showed you where the grip is in the first knuckle. And again, some drummers hold it in the second knuckle. Some drummers hold it the first knuckle with the second finger. Some drummers play flat-handed, you know, with the stick extension of their forearm, like this. Some great drummers play what they kind of call a French grip. They turn their hands over sideways and play fingers. I've heard some incredible drummers. So, some drummers, a lot of Scottish drummers, instead of the thumb being straight in the you know, traditional grip, they kind of cradle stick and bend the knuckle. So what I'm trying to say here, they all work. Keep an open mind. Apply them for different you know, uh, situations in your playing. So that's what it's all about as far as playing techniques. Basically, rudiments are combinations of single and double stroke stickings. Drummers, past and present, have relied on snare drum rudiments as a means to invent fills and patterns for solos and even for keeping time. In fact, every fill you've ever done is made up of some combination of rudiments like the three stroke rough, the five stroke roll, and the paradiddle diddle. First, you have to learn the sticking and how to count each rudiment. Then once you've got the hang of playing them on the snare drum, you can orchestrate each rudiment around the set and use them as punctuating devices in the song form, just like you would use cymbal turnarounds. You can also use rudiments to develop fills and solos. At this point, let's work on some rudiments and then develop them as drum fills. Okay, here's a three-stroke rough in its traditional form. One and two and three and four and one.
okay, here it is with a jazz feel. One, two, 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 two three, two, two, four, two, two. Okay, here's a three-stroke rough as a fill to punctuate the two-bar phrase. One, two, three, four. Now here's some three-stroke roughs with turnarounds to punctuate the blues song form. A one, two, three, four. Okay, now for some three-stroke rough variations and three-four time. First on the snare drum. A one, two, three, two, two, three. And here it is with the tie. One, two, three, two, two, three. Okay, now let's orchestrate them up on the cymbal. One, two, three, two, two, three. Another variation with the tie. One, two, three. Okay, here's a couple examples of jazz cymbal beats in 3-4 time. One, two, three, two, two, three. Here's another variation with a fast 3-4 pattern with the halftime feel. One, two, three, two, two, three. And now let's add a fill in a four bar phrase. One, two, three, two, two, three. Okay, I'm going to play a rhythmic variation of the three-stroke rough. One, two, three, two, two, three. Okay, now let's use the same rhythmic variation and a four-bar solos, four bars of time in front. One, two, three, two, two, three.
We've already talked about phrasing in three in 4-4 four, four time by using T highs. Well, you can use the three-stroke gruff to make it more interesting. Here's a little snare drum solo using the three-stroke gruff in 3-4 three, time. One, two, three. If we play the same 3-4 pattern in 4-4 four, four time, we end up with a two-bar T high like this. A one, two, three, four. Here's the same example orchestrated at the drum set as a four bar phrase. One, two, three, four. Now here's a three-stroke rough using an eight-bar phrase with a four-bar solo. A one, two, three, four. Okay, you can do the same types of things with the five-stroke roll. The five-stroke roll consists of two rights, two lefts, and a right, then two lefts, two rights, and a left. Now I'm going to be playing the five-stroke rolls as 30-second notes starting on the count of N, like so. One, and two, and three, and four, and. Now we can reverse that. We'll start the 30 second notes on the beat and end the five stroke roll on end like this. One and two and three and four and. And then here's still another variation. I'm gonna play four 30 second notes and two 16th notes. Now sometimes this is called the six stroke roll. One and two and three and four and. Okay, now I'd like to take these variations and I'm going to play a funk pattern and use the five-stroke roll as part of my time pattern on the hi-hat. Then I'm going to use the five-stroke roll as a pickup coming back to the time pattern and then I'll end up with a fill going around the drums like so. One, two, three, four. Okay, now I'd like to show you the five-stroke roll in a triplet feel. I'm going to count eighth note triplets and give you another variation of the five. One, two, 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 two three, two, two, four, two, two. Now I'll play it a little faster for you. One, two, three, four. Now, we could take this and put the accents up on the cymbal, like so. One, two, three, four. And then you could orchestrate it around the drum set, like so, a little faster. One, two, three, four. Now, to go along with the five-stroke roll with the triplet feel, I'm going to add what I call a half drag in an eighth note triplet. The half drag, we're going to reverse it, and it'll be two rights and a left, like so. One, two, 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 two three, two, two, four, two, two.
Now I'm going to combine that as a solo with the five stroke roll and this reverse half drag. One, two, three, four. Now let's put it up on the cymbal as a fill. One, two, a one, two, three, four. Now I'm going to do the same rudiments and put it in a 3-4 field to get this effect. One, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> 